So let me introduce David. Uh, David is the chief technologist of the computational research department at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. He received a BS in mathematics from Brigham Young University. His PhD is in mathematics from Stanford University. And uh, David has published three books and over 100 technical papers in the general area of high performance scientific computing and computational mathematics. He has also published some papers in the area of science and religion. So today, uh, David is going to talk about, uh, if I get to the right one, um, in the uh, past few decades, uh, there's been breathtaking advances in science and technology, as we've heard um, from some of the uh, mentions of, uh, of uh, you know, the, the approach to this quote unquote singularity. And uh, our daily living patterns and social institutions and religi religious institutions have all been affected. Unfortunately for those who dislike change, the forecast is for more of the same. It's going to be unrelenting, even accelerating change for decades to come. Nanotechnology, biotechnology, information technology, and medical technology are all poised for dramatic advances. And uh, I'll let, let uh, I'm not gonna read the whole abstract, but uh, David's gonna, gonna um, let us in on what that uh, has in store for us as far as dangers that we need to look out for and how can we direct these developments for good and not evil. So I'll let David go. Thank you, thank you. Um, I might mention here that uh, uh, the Berkeley lab uh, wanted to do a promo for some of the scientists, and so I actually was selected and got my, uh, um, my photo here on the side of a, uh, of a shuttle bus that went between the Berkeley uh, BART station and the, uh, and the lab. And so this was uh, featuring some of some stuff, I'd, uh, some papers I wrote about pi. David. So in the background, those are real digits of pi. David, can, yes. I, can I ask you to speak into the mic, please? Sure, sure, Thank very you. much. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, so anyway, that's what this is. I might mention, if any of you are interested in this, I have put the, both the paper and this, these actual PowerPoint slides on my website. So uh, no one ever has to actually attend any of my talks. Uh, they just, just go to my website, you can, you can read it. Okay, so um, I was just speaking with, uh, talking with uh, Catherine Hagland at lunch and we were over our sandwiches and we were uh, talking about this curious trend where in some academic circles over the past few decades, it was uh, fashionable to, to question whether science really makes progress. And, uh, and even some uh, notable figures such as uh, uh, Thomas Kuhn uh, questioned, you know, whether the scientist really was, science really was making any progress to, uh, to fundamental truth. And this, I think, really started to get a lot of momentum, a lot of, uh, Postmodern writers were were involved in this. Uh, now a lot of this was punctured with this Sokol hoax, where this physicist uh, Alan Sokol wrote uh, an article with a lot of this jargon and actually got it uh, that there was complete spoof, nonetheless, and actually got it published in a leading postmodern journal. But uh, nonetheless, there's still a lot of this mentality out there. That's really surprising how often you hear it, um, and even like. Um, this Will and Ariel Durant, some of you have their, you know, that 11 volume story of civilization. And then sort of an additional volume they wrote called Lessons of History. They, one of their questions was, is, is progress real? And I think perhaps uh, uh, most of concern to me is sometimes I even hear talk like this, um, even in some of our, our church meetings, you know, people uh, say, oh, uh, society's just going to, to hell in a handbag and, uh, you know, uh, nothing we can do about it. And they always see everything in terms of decline. But, you know, to me as a scientist and a technologist, this talk like this is just, is incomprehensible. I, I, I can't even relate to it, much less agree with it. 
And, you know, because everything we see in the scientific world and in modern technology is just one of relentless and, and frankly, inspiring progress. And what I would like to argue here in this talk is that progress is not something we should fight against, or, but it's something that we as Mormons should embrace, that we should, we should not only embrace but identify with uh, doesn't mean that there aren't challenges and problems, but uh, I think Mormonism at its core is a progressive religion. So anyway, uh, just, a, just a very brief uh, history of the past, say, 50 or 100 years. Uh, I think we have to agree that it's been really a remarkable period. Uh, more people than, than ever before have had opportunities for for higher education, far more than in, in previous uh, decades or centuries. We have the, uh, the media, radio and television, uh, which in spite of it being a, a mixed blessing, nonetheless, it really helps a lot of people stay uh, abreast of modern, what's happening in the world. Uh, the computers, I, I still remember the time when computers were some uh, very expensive, uh, uh, things in large cabinets in, the, in a big room in a government laboratory. And then they some started to appear, say, in some larger universities and businesses. And then finally, I, I remember the time of the, uh, the, the Apple II first, and the Apple started to come and, and appeared in the home, and the, the IBM PC. And now uh, we, you know, I have one in my uh, nice uh, Apple iPhone here in my pocket. and. And you might say, well, it's not really fair to compare my Apple iPhone with, with a supercomputer, uh, say, of past year, some of the, because, you know, I mean, after all, but uh, after all, my, my iPhone has a lot more memory than those supercomputers. <laughs> so, uh, and it's a lot faster, too. But, uh, so anyway, all of these, the internet, uh, and we're just starting to see now a whole new wave of medical technology and pharmaceuticals. And science has not stood still. Every, every week there's some new development, some new discovery. We're pushing forth the, the frontiers. Uh, no one can deny that, that there is a, a progress going on. And I would say there's even moral progress. People that, uh, that follow uh, long-term trends have noted that the number of armed conflicts, uh, in spite of what we may sort of have the impression from reading the news, is actually declining sharply. And, uh, and part of it is that the, this phenomenon that our worldwide economic system has made warfare among major trading partners unthinkable uh, because you know, it would disrupt our, our economies. Nonetheless, there are downsides. There's no doubt about it. Um, we, uh, a lot of people are getting left behind. Um, we're producing trash and pollution as prolifically as we're producing products and services. And, um, uh, and this business of global warming and you know, fossil fuel de dependency, this has really reared its head in the last few years. Uh, the internet, uh, many millions of new jobs have been created with the internet, but um, on the other hand, 90% of all email is spam and um, the, the pornography and viruses. Uh, clearly, there's just an awful lot of, of trouble there, too. Um, I think it's also important to note that a lot of um, particularly more fundamentalist conservative religions, I'm thinking like a lot of some of the evangelical sects, have been greatly challenged, particularly by uh, findings in modern science. They were used to thinking more of the, of the Bible as being a complete description of, um, of the world, and they're, they're very troubled but to see uh, scientific developments that weren't described in the, in the Bible. And the whole business of creationism has is, is re reared its head and continues to be a challenge. The, these are groups that are continuing to try to pressure state legislatures to bring creationism into the classroom. So there's been a lot of, a lot of downside. But what's, what's the current hold, or the current, what will the future hold? Uh, well, like, like the, my introducer mentioned, there's unfortunately gonna be more of the same. There's uh, 
uh, recent developments and things like nanotechnology and um, is assuring us that this Moore's law of computer technology is going to continue unabated for uh, probably for decades to come. Uh, it's just astounding. Uh, here, uh, in, in some ways, the computer processors, maybe individual cores are not getting faster, but there are more cores on a chip. So we can, we can still get, you know, multiple times uh, more work done. And as software starts to become written to take advantage of all of these, we will continue to see this, this increase in power. And certainly memory continues on this same curve. Um, artificial intelligence is making great strides. Just in the past few years, there have been a lot of some, some real great improvements in some of these intelligent softwares. I put here just a little list of some of the uh, lingo of the modern era. Uh, how, many, uh, how many know what er all of these terms are? Ah, we have one, two, two hands, three, four. Uh, I myself just have to continually be, uh, you know, keep up to try to keep up with things here. I had to, uh, a couple years ago, I had to ask someone what Facebook was, you know. Well, uh, so um, again, just a, just a very brief here. I won't go into uh, some of these developments, but uh, things like that. At one time, it was just thought that you know computers would never be able to match a human at playing chess. Well, we all know that's ten years ago now. Uh, a world champion was soundly defeated by a, a computer program. Um, in my business, scientific supercomputers, it's just up, up, up. We continue, you know, every year there are more and more powerful uh, computer systems that continue to press the outer envelope of what we can do with these large-scale scientific simulations. So much that many people now are saying that these scientific simulations are a th third fundamental mode of scientific discovery after theory and experiment. We have so many of our phenomena that we can simulate on the computer that are too expensive or too dangerous to uh, do an experiment with, uh, or things like the Earth's climate or, or an exploding supernova that we, we can't really do at all, but we cannot study on the computer. Um, and medical technology is really starting to take off. Uh, some of the people have mentioned that uh, some of the developments that they, some of the optimists are, are boldly predicting 100 to 120 year lifespans, and those are some of the more conservative ones. Other people are just boldly saying that, you know, the whole, we will, you know, start extending life indefinitely. And uh, so uh, here's just a, a, a graph that's in, in, in my line of work in scientific supercomputers. It's called the top 500 list that's updated every six months of the world's uh, uh, most powerful 500 uh, computer systems. And if we look at the, uh, the number top, the number 500, that's this center curve. And right now we just recently went above one petaflops, which means 10 to the 15th or a million billion floating point operations per second, where a floating point operation is like, a, say, a 16-digit uh, add or multiply. So uh, we're on this curve, it just relentlessly upward. There's no, no sign at all that that's leveling off or, uh, or that we're, we're coming to an end there. So wh what are some of these, these uh, issues that, uh, about these developments? Certainly there are, there are, a, lot of, there are a lot of dangers here. And even some of the optimists are acknowledging there's some real dangers ahead. I mean, you, you, you know, insert your favorite uh, sci-fi movie uh, here, you know, it's uh, just about anything you want to imagine from uh, computers getting smarter than their masters to, uh, to gray goo of nanotechnology running amok. Um, some of you have heard this article, Why the Future Doesn't Need Us. Uh, by, by this uh, computer technologist, Bill Joy. And, and even some of the very more, more optimistic uh, observers like, uh, like Ray Kurzweil, that's been mentioned a couple times here already, even he acknowledges there are some real dangers. We've got to be careful. We've got to carefully manage uh, what's ahead. 
Uh, unfortunately, I think everyone also agrees that we can't do much to stop it. You know, how, how are we going to tell someone who's handicapped that they can't use some great new uh, artificial arm that can be controlled by, by certain thought uh, impulses uh, just because, you know, some of us who have all of our faculties are just a little, little uneasy with that? Or how are we going to tell some Chinese farmer that uh, he can't plant some great new rice strain just because a few overweight Americans uh, are, you know, are a little, little uncomfortable. You can't. The best we can do then is to manage the, the advance of this technology and make sure that it is for good and, and not for evil. Um, here are just a few issues that we, you know, sample issues that we might think of. Um, like, uh, how can we encourage, you know, constructive use of technology and yet make sure that the, some of the bad things don't happen? Someone gave the example of, of a parent uh, wanting to design a deaf child. You know, well, you know, how, how can we legally and, and, and in our, our, uh, our, our society, how can we infor have laws and regulations that would prevent this type of thing from happen. And what about this digital divide between the, the haves and have nots? A lot of people are getting left behind. A lot of people are, are being, a lot of students are being graduated without the level of education that they need to really be uh, functional in this future society. Clearly that we need help there. Um, someone has mentioned how will in the future when we have intelligent computers, uh, enhanced humans and conventional humans, how can all of these three races of people uh, peacefully and respectfully coexist? So we just mentioned education. Uh, I think this is clearly a top priority. Uh, the US is not moving ahead. It's falling behind by numerous measures. In the meantime, we are overcoming this deficit by importing a lot of very bright people from China and India but now they have opportunities in their own countries and they are returning to, uh, to their home and not coming here. So we, we can only use that card so long. We've got to fix our uh, educational system. Fortunately, the, U, the LDS Church has always had a strong uh, tradition of education. Um, let me just mention here, I think it's, it's interesting to note that this, some of the earlier speakers have already talked about this idea of progress in LDS thought and how this has really been a, a central uh, uh, aspect of our religion. It's really quite, quite unique. Uh, I'm always struck by this, our statement of the ninth uh, article of faith and I was reading this uh, book called The Idea of Progress by Robert Nisbet. And he said, mankind is advanced in the past, is now advancing, and will continue to advance for the foreseeable future. So, whoa, you know, I've, I've heard this before. But there really is a real a, a resonance here that I think is just not widely appreciated in the church. Um, here are just a few quotes that I'll, I'll just go through here um, while uh, just, uh, we have a few more minutes. Uh, Brigham Young mentioned that the, the, great, the, the mainspring of all action is the principle of improvement. Uh, and it says that we have this principle within us to continue to increase and to treasure up truth, truth until we come, become perfect. Uh, or he says that if we have lived for millions of years in the presence of God and angels, will we cease learning? No, we'll continue. You know, and this is very much different than a lot of the traditional Christian view of what heaven is all about. Uh, and he specifically emphasized of how our religion encompasses all of the truth in the world, whether it be scientific or, or religious. Uh, B. H. Roberts, uh, much in the same the same vein, he uh, even argued that that with the restoration as part of this great awakening of, of modern science. Uh, in one of his writings, he just says, you know, he really recommended, he says, to give attention to and, and credence to scientific research is to link the church of God with the highest increase of human thought and effort. 
Uh, more recently, Hubie, uh, Hubie Brown, in, his, uh, in a book that was uh, published with some of his writings, he mentions how that we should be in the forefront of learning in all fields. And he says, revelation doesn't just come through a prophet of God or directly from heaven, but it also comes in the, lab in the laboratory, in the test tube and out of the thinking mind and the inquiring soul. Um, already, I, I can see a lot of us are thinking in, in similar terms. We've already had mention of this philosopher, um, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, I believe is how it's pronounced. Uh, he mentions how that if we would incorporate this idea of progress into our worldview, that how that this would immediately and radically put an end to this war between science and religion that's been, been such a, a problem. Um, and to mention the, the transhumanists, I've read some of their writings, Mark uh, Geddes, who's one of the leading transhumanists, he said the following. He pointed out that this desire for immortality is not something, not only something that has been taught in all major religious traditions and, and through history, but he notes how that uh, it's really the fundamental principle behind morality. Because if you know that you are going to have to be responsible for something, you know, five years, ten years, a thousand years, a million years into the future, then doing something that's wrong or unethical is unthinkable. And that uh, I think that's a really interesting thought, that the immortality itself is the basis of, of morality. Uh, just uh, one more quote here by Albert Schweitzer, just a really inspiring uh, quote. He says, to affirm life is to deepen and to uh, someone who affirms life experiences life as its own and he accepts as being good to preserve life, to promote life, to raise it to its <clears throat> highest value uh, and also to destroy life or to uh, repress life is is the, the these are, this is the fundamental principle of morality. I, I won't read it all. You can you can read it there, but just a, I think a very very important principle that that immortality and eternal life really is the the basis of uh, of 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 religion and to the extent that we we identify this and see the progressive view in Mormonism of advancing to uh, that our current life is just part of an immortality where we are eternally progressing. This is just such a, a wonderful and beautiful principle that uh, you know, I think we, we should you know, shout it to the world. So just in spite of the uh, uh, you know, many dangers and challenges, I think there are a lot of reasons to be, to be optimistic. Uh, this is a great time to be alive. And I'm, I'm really glad that I am here, here and now. I don't look to the past with nostalgia. Uh, I want to be here now. Thank you. So uh, we have a few um, minutes for questions. Yes. Um, you mentioned the statistic that New College was stayed in the earliest church of the group. had a very hard We measure that, but it's, it's an interesting question. Yes. Well, I do know of uh, Stephen Jones, who's an LDS who worked at the University of Utah, uh, which is around the same time uh, that uh, Pons and Fleischer were working on confusion. There was a big controversy about that, but there has been new uh, sightings in uh, journals in China and Japan having positive results later, uh, lately. And so that's kind of like a, an example of an LDS uh, scientist being in the midst of new creative. Yes. Uh, part of the response to that question that I'm going to ask for you, uh, one of the recent studies, not recent, because there haven't been any updates, but a decade ago or so ago, it looked at education levels versus activity and faith. 
And it was found that in most cases, the more educated your person was, the less inflammatory yes. they were in their faith. However, the other is the kind of Yes, that's very interesting. The, now, there's what he's saying that there's a study that showed that the LDS church bucks the normal trend that higher education less leads to lower levels of, of uh, religious activity and faith. Yes? One of the, the difficulties you mentioned at the top but didn't discuss was the, uh, the problem of keeping this, some of this advanced technology out of the hands of those who would misuse it. How do you do that? Uh, by other technical methods. <laughs> In other words, we have to apply technology to keep technology uh, private, or in other words, uh, to restrict its access. Um, and so it, there, there are no easy, there's no easy answer, but it's just something we have to be aware of all the time. I think if we were redesigning the internet, and we may have to, we would design it from ground up for security. Uh, you know, the people that originally designed it didn't have any idea of the sort of, you know, uh, malware, the stuff that would go on. Our, our ethics have not very often kept up with our technology. Uh, it doesn't take much more to clone a human than it does to clone a goat. Yeah. What then? Um, there ha that hasn't happened yet. Uh, it, it might. I, I know that's a big issue. I don't know what the answer is there. Okay, we, um, we'd like to thank uh, David for uh, coming. Thank you.